story of snowboarding for me is really one word. Life. Life shapes everything. Where did snowboarding come from? I'll answer that question. It all started with my little board. It was Vietnam time and uh, pretty serious stuff. The roots of modern snowboarding go back to the 1960s. It was the beginning of a major revolution in our country. America was going through a real revolution and change in attitudes, moving away from the old guard thinking to sort of a new era. People moving out, people moving in, why? Because of the color of the skin. Run, 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 but you sure can't hide. When Vietnam happened, there was, was a lot of heavy crap. A lot of objections just to the government in general. We were growing our hair long. You had a lot of people surfing and stuff at that time, and that's what caught all of us. It was like all of a sudden, ah. Surfing had always been popular, but the counterculture movement took it into the mainstream. Its appeal went far beyond the beaches. Its influences were even felt thousands of miles away on the snowy shores of Lake Michigan. I always wished I could surf. Not being on the oceans where it was going on, I, all I could do was watch the films. It was December 25th, 1965, and we'd had a big snow dump on the shore of Lake Michigan. My wife was eight months pregnant. She came in the living room and said, Sherm, you gotta get these kids out of the house. Necessity is the mother of invention. I saw my oldest daughter, Wendy's little 32-inch skis from Kmart. So I put these two little skis together and braced them. I said, my gosh, we're surfing. This hill it's really a wave. You could surf it all day long. My wife dreamed up the word snurfer. You can't hear the word and not smile. Everybody started playing on this thing. Even my dad. We'd sit there and say, you know, this is so much fun. Muskegon is the home of Brunswick Corporation. When you're wondering what to do, where they make bowling alleys, bowling pins, uh, bowling balls. And I had two or three really good friends, engineers that worked there. So call a friend. Bowl Brunswick tomorrow. Brunswick wanted to get their hands on it before anybody else did. So they took the snurf route, developed it. The skateboard culture was really booming, and it was a counterculture. There's a new terror loose in the streets of the city. Probably the most organized attempt yet by children to dominate the world. They can do almost the same thing as you can do on a, on a wave. They were advertising the snurfer as a winter skateboard. Time was right, circumstances were right, and he had that flash of brilliance to, to put it all together. We were starting to have downhill contests. It was all just a barrel of fun. We'd go to the local state park. They started coming, just lots of them. Snurfing happens to be my favorite sport. I do it almost every day, and I've had the same board for 12 years. Snurfing is adaptable to all age groups for play or for sports. There are outrageous hot doggers, and there are Sunday snurfers who coast down the hill. And they started offering cash prizes for the contests. And that's when Jake Burton Carpenter got involved in 1979. 
Gotcha. I'm uh, Jake Burton Carpenter of Burton Snowboards in London area, Vermont. Those boards were barely rideable, but it was fun. That's why I pursued it with my life. I thank him forever because of the energy and the devotion and the sacrifice this young man went through. How'd you get into it? Well, a uh, company called uh, with Brunswick Corporation used to make something called a Snurfer a long time ago, and I rode those for about the last 10 years. Nobody really improved it, and living back east and just sort of getting flustered with that particular board, I just decided to start making something on my own. He had brought some of his own, which were wider and bigger, that he'd made. He'd cut up an inner tube and put it over the board, so you had like a binding. Uh, it's a good old round board, and there are a lot of good boards out. It's a good sport. Hope everybody around Colorado and around the country gets into it. The technological advances were so monumental over what we had previously that people would sit there and say, wow, straps on a snowboard. That is unbelievable. I started the company in 77. It was just very, very tough. I could only use the factory uh, from like midnight until four in the morning. So th this was probably around 3.30, I think. You know, nobody wanted them. I think he came from a very buttoned down East Coast upbringing that allowed him to have the discipline to move forward as a businessman as well as a snowboarder. I wasn't super happy living in New York City, working ridiculous hours. I was working with a company that was selling smaller companies to big companies. If I was going to work that hard, I might as well do my own thing. I inherited some money because my mother died when I was pretty young. So I busted a move, left my job, started making snowboards. I think he brought those tools that you learn as a stockbroker to it. When you want to make a gain, you take a calculated risk and you execute it. Nineteen eighty one here at Ski Cooper was really the very first actual contest. East Coast met West Coast. It was clear that there would be a rivalry that would start on that mountain that would take years and years and years to fully shape. I think they were different sides of the same coin. One was East Coast, one was absolutely West Coast. One was more buttoned down, the other one was absolutely just, you know, living the California dream. Tom Sims and Jake Burton. Tom Sims, when I first met him, rolled up with a six foot tall blonde and was a rock star. It was all about survival, you know, and he was a serious threat. Jake Burton thought I had stolen the idea of snowboarding from him, and he was upset right out of the chute, which was quite the opposite. I'd already been snowboarding for 15 years. Hi, I'm Tom Sims, and I'm uh, here today, and I was competing in the, in the first major ski board competition that we've ever had. Uh, I invented ski boarding 18 years ago, in 1963, and my intent at the time was to simulate uh, skateboarding and surfing in, uh, in the wintertime on the snow. When he claimed to have been the guy that invented the sport, I had a very difficult time with that. I mean, I know I was selling snowboards before he was. It was just a vicious rivalry. Kids that are into skateboarding and surfing are first naturals, and they're already excited on it. All of this snowboarding for me, my whole life, it all started with skateboarding. So I was just street surfing, a barefoot in swim trunks when the surf wasn't good. Tom, when I first met him, living in the commune with him, that's when we got really, really close. We grew our own food. We had chickens, we got eggs out of them. We were all smoking joints. We surfed every single day, skated the days that the surf wasn't good. Uh, it was just, it was a really a wonderful time to grow up. My family started taking me up skiing when I was about seven years old. And I loved it and got right into it. The skiing industry at the time was a very closed society. It was not open to new ideas or new people. 
And it was economically driven. If you had the money, then you had the access. If you didn't have the money, you didn't have the access. Jake was a businessman. He understood the ski industry better than anybody. And he understood that we needed to be a little more structured. He definitely had a vision for what he wanted to do in snowboarding. Tom was living in a treehouse in Santa Barbara, developing one of the biggest skateboard companies in the world. We were making, at the time, what were considered the best wheels and the best boards, so a lot of the very best riders gravitated towards my way of thinking and what skateboarding was. If you were a skateboarder and you lived in California, the holy grail was getting in your car, finding the best keyhole pool you could find, and climbing a fence and getting into it. They say you can't skate in the parks, you can't skate in the youth clubs, you can't use the YMCAs, you can't use any of the facilities. The kids are forced out into the street. With us today is one of the world's great champions. Here is Tom Sims, right here. It's really caught on, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are thousands of people on skateboards. Literally, yeah, hundreds yeah. of thousands. Tom, I mean, he was all about style and everything he did. And it was just natural for him to take that over in snowboarding. The only people that I could get to embrace snowboarding were skateboarders. Jake and I had completely different visions of where the sport should go. We had a very bumpy start to our relationship. The whole riff of Tom doesn't like Jake and there's a beef there, there was actually Tom feeling, I don't have all the tools to beat this guy. Tom would openly say to you, I'm a bad business guy. We've got five or six very healthy skateboard manufacturers now, so there's going to be plenty of skateboards available for all those kids that are going to get into it. I think what's true is Tom Sims invented the snowboarder. Whether he invented the actual snowboard or not, I think there's a lot of people who can lay a similar claim to that. There was a lot of different thought processes, whether you were on the East Coast with Jake Burton or you were Winter Stick in Utah or you were Sims or Chuck Barfoot out here on the West Coast, all kind of similar timing. It turns out someone from every board placed well in all three contests. And it was real close. But I'm going to start from out of the overall winners. The third place overall was Tom Sims. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Riding the Sims board. How many points? Uh, uh five. <laughs> I was wondering. Oh, wait, I was on the wait a minute. Hold it. Scratch that. I made a mistake. Third place overall went to Jake. Yeah! And he got four points. And he got four points. Four points. Okay. Thanks a lot. Overall. Second place went to Tom Sims. Yeah! Tom Sims! The guy who won the freestyle, Scott Jacobs. You won that? All right. Congratulations. You picked up a big one. Came all the way from Utah. Have a nice tune ride home. All right. 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 This contest is really good, considering it was is the first contest ever. Next year, we're going to be able to do something where it's going to blow minds on ABC, Wide World of Sports, you know. It's the greatest rush ever. And I hope that uh, it happens more often. Jake Burton and Tom Sims both wanted to be the biggest names in snowboarding. Over the next few years, the competition between them drove the young sport forward. Well, we've got a Lulu for you tonight. It's called snowboarding, and this is one of the zaniest we've seen in a long time. Tom Sims speaks in a language perhaps only a snowboarder can understand. 
full-length metal edges and uh, graphite underneath the centered PTEX and ABS and Kevlar and graphite reinforced binding. So the sport's... What the hell does all that mean? It means the sport's gone high-tech. It kind of started to develop to have straps on your feet and then actually binding, putting more ski technology into the boards to uh, make them tougher and stronger. Tom, snowboarding, the sport, how do you feel about it right now? Well, the sport's come so far in the last three years that uh, it looks like it, there's no stopping it now. In the last two years, we've had so many equipment advances that the riders are able to handle more difficult terrain. So the contests are getting better, the kids are getting better. It's all up from here. It's gonna go all the way. It's just doubling every year. It's gonna, gonna keep going. It's the best sport. <laughs> Board skiers go snowboarding. <laughs> Yeehaw. Viva Snowboards. All right. Yeah. All right. And I guess they're tied onto those things. They're no safety straps. Boy, I Not need, like skis. I, I need two <laughs> at least. Well, Stormy's up next. The sun finally made an appearance today. Didn't matter what the weather was doing outside. They were singularly focused on improving their products. The rivalry between Tom and I pushed the sport at an incredible pace. The sport was growing quickly, but there was one major obstacle. Most local ski hills are reluctant to let snow surfers use their lifts. At least the long trudge back up keeps you in shape. The ski industry hated us. It was as if we had no rights, as if we were second-class citizens, and they did everything they could to keep us out. We try and keep them separated, and they'll just lip us off. And they're dangerous, because if one of these uh, skateboards or ski boards, whatever they're called, hit a person, they'd break their leg because they're just like a missile. But where there's a will, there's always a way. They have to hike to the top of the mountain and then find a secluded ski trail where they won't get caught. The ski patrol says it's got its hands full. Quite a lot of them are uncooperative. Um, some of them have had a little bit to drink. We're trying to get snowboarding allowed, but the skaters who had never been skiers, didn't understand noun etiquette at all. Everybody was partying together, you know, it was total debauchery, and a lot of times they all went to jail together, and <laughs> total punk. We don't have to be like in the sub world. I think a lot of the people who were coming into the snowboard scene uh, were listening to a lot of contemporary punk music at the time. They were bringing that attitude, they were bringing that passion. They were really changing the look of the ski industry without even knowing it. Purple hair and rings in their noses and, uh, and wild outfits. The energy level was fierce. The atmosphere was a lot like being in high school and not fitting in. We really didn't know what we were doing or that we were onto something that was going to be big. We were just in the moment. Luckily, we had people like Norm Saylor at Donner Ski Ranch to right in the beginning welcome us and say, hey, Let's see what you got. When the first person came to me and asked if he could buy a lift ticket, he had a $10 bill in one hand and a snowboard in the other one. And I said, you know what? I want the $10 bill. Before you know it, gosh, there were all of these kids crawling out of the woodwork, all skate punks. Oh, shit. You couldn't tell them what to do. They aren't going to listen to you. I just said, give me 10 bucks and I don't have to listen to you. They swear at you, they tell you to get lost, mind your own business. How are you going to tell me what I can do? Sorry that you've been brainwashed into thinking a certain way. Hey, here's your job, and go to school and follow the rules, and creativity doesn't matter. Ah, uh, the fashion back then was neon, punk. A lot of it came from thrift store stuff, because that's all we could afford. They didn't accept us because we didn't look like them, speak like them, or act like them. Do you see any compromise in the future at all? No, we don't want them at all. I have to say that Jake Carpenter did a lot to open those doors because he spoke the language of a ski resort operator. He put a tremendous amount of energy and sacrifice into getting ski areas to accept the board. Resorts wouldn't let the snowboarders in, so they had to find other places to ride. Skiing was like 20 bucks at the time for a lift ticket, which was a lot of money. And it was like, hey, you can get a snowboard and just, you know, just going out and finding some powder on a hill and hiking it. We would get in our car. We weren't hunting for pools, but we were hunting for spots. 
There's powder, we got a car, we got a set of chains. There's some place out there waiting for us to ride. Finding a little stash, mining it for gold. Yeah, it looks like somebody worked in that landing area. Ooh, my one lip's still going though. I got a call from Mike Chantry that there was a quarter pipe in the woods made out of snow. I said, I got to see this. That thing's cool. Want to get a flip on camera, dude? Yeah, here sure. you go, Mike. Check it out. Over this dude's it had head. been a city dump, so a bulldozer had scooped out dirt to cover garbage. Nice Terry Kidwell, Sean Palmer, Keith Kimmel. I just remember sitting there and thinking, okay. These guys look kind of wild. On top. They're just kind of kids from trailer parks and rough homes. The snowboarding was, was what they had. When I first started snowboarding, we weren't allowed to ski areas, so we had to hike. We all shared a couple winter sticks in between like four people. So they had an in run and then one hit, just one hit. Go. Holy shit, Dad. God damn. <laughs> yeah. Historically, uh, it was the place where freestyle was developed. Yeah, Terry. We built it up yeah. and basically started doing some skate tricks on a snowboard there. Yeah. We were just trying to figure out what we could do on a board at that time. I got up there and I was just like, fuck, this isn't a hand plant. Whoa. You okay? <laughs> I'm stuck. They were the ultimate testers because they were just so rough on equipment and were so demanding of it. With Terry Kidwell, he was just on the team instantly. Oh, got that on film. Got to get this, I want to try something. Watch out, Sean. footage from that is just mind-blowing and it really established snowboarding in so many of our heads when we were young. Oh wow, this really is skateboarding on snow. We can actually do this. Blue minds at the time. Amazing. Seriously amazing. That's when I had the idea to launch the half pipe as an event. Yeah. It's the first time all of us went to a place that snowboarding had never been before. It's the first rocket to the moon. <laughs> the first half pipe ever. This was a seminal moment. Hey, tell Terry to quit splashing my lens. Not all of these competitors got their style riding the waves. At the half pipe aerial event, it's obvious many graduated from skateboards. The Burton guys were off on the side of the mountain. They were all in matching speed suits. They were all doing exercises. Everybody was warmed up and getting ready to go. And there was a guy named Alan Armbruster and Terry Kidwell who were off to the side of the run trying to learn how to do a McTwist. And these guys were trying McTwist. It seemed impossible to me. I, I literally remember just sitting there thinking, these guys have a totally different vision of what's going to happen here. Go and that you want to go right around it, get the rhythm, go whenever you want. Jake, you want it, he considered it more racing than, as opposed to the freestyle. We thought that wasn't snowboarding. So him and Tom and the rest of us would butt heads a lot on that. I think you need some green wax, bro. It was all about racing. I think it had to be because we didn't know what side cut was, the boards didn't turn. I think that that was a stage that it had to go through. Jake felt that the half pipe should be banned from competition. I wanted my way, which was to have half pipes at snowboarding events. We staged this contest, one, to help the sport grow, but also 
to get it on television so that ski areas could see that we could control the snowboards. The real attraction to snowboarding is what's known as half piping. It's skateboarding without the skates and it's packed with phrases such as, rip it up, dude. The Sims team riders were all competent skateboarders and they ripped it up. It didn't make the Burton team from back east very happy. The Burton team organized a boycott at the half pipe until I convinced them that, you know, it's fun. Basically, everything came from the riders. You know, it wasn't me saying, hey, this sport's going to go alpine or freestyle or whatever. It's always been riders that have driven it. And that's one of the healthiest things about the sport. It was very apparent that the thing that people wanted to watch, the star of the show, was half pipe snowboarding. Burton realized half pipe snowboarding is the magic. And we have to get the magic in this company before we get beat by the cool kids by Sims. Once he figured out that he needed half pipe snowboarding, there was really only one other piece to figure out. Who's it gonna be that rides that pipe for Burton? Snowboarding is just like living because you have fun moments and harsh moments and scared. Some days it seems like you're just working and sometimes you're just having fun. I would say that Craig was the first really professional snowboarder, somebody who really put the time and effort into the craft that he was practicing to become better. Craig was very stylish. His riding was, was different from everyone else's. Everyone looked up at him and wanted to be like him. Craig's a friend of mine. I respect him. I've ridden with him a few times on the team. And I don't have anything to say about him other than that I think he's probably the best snowboarder in the world. Craig Kelly was uh, the soul of snowboarding, really. Craig Kelly, he was a dirtbag like me. <laughs> we could be on a trip for a week and not take a shower. Whoa, whoa, what's up? just a, a very affable, likable character who put both beauty and fun into snowboarding. How long did it take you to pick this up? Uh, the first day I was having fun and within a couple of days I was riding down most runs at the mountain I was at. First time I won a race was at Pack West Ski Area, which is down by Seattle. That was actually one of my first dates with Kelly Joe too. It was a nice little coincidence. And I won this little race, so it was like 50 bucks for first, I think. It was really nothing, but two weeks later I won the my first world title at Breckenridge, Colorado on the slalom. If you were a professional snowboarder, you had to do all these alpine events, and then half pipe came in and had to do them all, and it was all about the overall title. Craig rode soft boots, but he killed it in alpine as well as freestyle. Way to be, bro. You're driving far faster, bro, bro. Craig Kelly came up to me and said, you know, is there any way that I could be on the Sims team? And of course, I had seen him ride, and I handed him my snowboard. I felt like he was my brother when we were snowboarding, and he had such great style and was such a good influence on the other team riders. But eventually, I realized I could make money at it, and I get my traveling paid for. It's only on bound for Japan. The main thing for me is being able to travel and, and ride in good condition to just have fun snowboarding all year round. And it was also really fun to win. Once on the Sims team, Craig Kelly quickly became the greatest half-pipe rider on the circuit. All these guys started to get the photos and the magazines, and people were shooting video of them. And you have the Juicy Fruit commercials and stuff. Strap your snowboards on, grab a stick of Juicy Fruit. The taste is gonna move ya. The thing with Craig, he was really smart money-wise. Like the Juicy Fruit commercial, he made 10 times what the other guys made. Everybody else just wanted to party and piss it away. Craig's like, no, no, no. The sport was starting to get some attention. All of a sudden, people knew about it. Money people. They're not snowboarders. Do you ever think about when you out of here? Record deal and video out of here. Mercedes Benz and Ray Wolf are out of here. They've become a group that has been motivated by community. The sport took a 
big change in direction from being very soulful and grassroots to going on its way to becoming a mainstream big bucks industry. Jake Burton, who was an astute businessman, was about to make a decision that would shake Sim's snowboards. Jake Carpenter realized that he needed to have a top freestyle rider in his stable. I think Jake was like hungrier, harder, nose to the grindstone, really making it happen. Tom wasn't like quite as focused on that level. You guys have got to go board this winter. Better yet, why don't we just take him there right now? You mean high space? Sims was ran by a bunch of kids. I was one of them. We were a bunch of kids sitting there against the next stockbroker who presumably had a shitload of money and we're trying to beat him. And it was just destiny. It was just destiny that we would win. I had a lot of promises and things that were broken. It seems I thought things were gonna happen, but they never did. No new boards, always the same old stuff. Jake Burton had heard that Craig Kelly wasn't happy with Sims. When Craig Kelly's name came up as an opportunity, Jake jumped at it. Craig Kelly wanted to get listened to, and he wanted a company that was committed to snowboarding, and he knew that was the deal with us. Jake Burton began quiet negotiations with Craig. They're telling Craig that snowboarders should be making a lot of money and promised him the world. And all of a sudden, I find out that he's being recruited by Burton for a phenomenal amount of money. I go, he's gone now. There's no way you're going to get Craig back. Um, he carried a grudge pretty much for years after that. It just felt like the dagger was going deeper. It was, it was brutal. Within a few years, the Sims Snowboard Company had gone bankrupt. It turned into a great relationship between Craig and Jake. I'm glad I made the change because Burton, they listened to me and had a big part of the company. It really felt good to do that. I was poorly treated for a while, and I just had to escape that environment that I didn't like. Craig Kelly, you're the partner. With Burton behind him, Craig Kelly became the most successful snowboarder the world had ever seen. He was the messiah to a lot of kids, and people followed what he did, the industry followed what he did, and I think he felt a responsibility to keep snowboarding cool. For many years, Craig Kelly was the unbeatable snowboarder. Craig did more for the sport and for the company than probably anybody. He had an incredibly rough ride getting to be the number one pro. Back then, you got to realize, like, some of us did freestyle slalom, and we were doing a contest every weekend. That was really tiring. You, you become Superman at that point. You learn about pressure and trying to balance that. Craig Kelly began to realize that competition wasn't everything. When we were in the backcountry, I think that's where he felt most at home. It's like being out in the, in the backcountry. As his career progressed, he wanted to ride non-man-made features. He wanted to go big and everything else, but he just wanted to do it with what was there. Here's Craig Kelly on the snow. This is a guy reputed to earn $600,000 a year from snowboarding, and he's been world champion three times running. Just relax and watch Craig Kelly on the snow. Good morning, some fallout from the stock market collapse. Now the young whiz kids with their expensive apartments and lifestyles are wondering where those salaries of up to a million dollars a year are going to come from now. So now reality is going to set in. There was a massive economic recession and downturn in the last part of the 80s. So quickly, ski resorts caught on, probably because of the dollars. The snowboarders were helping the ski industry because the ski industry was kind of dying. Snowboarders have always had an image problem. They're too reckless, too rambunctious. But as it turns out, snowboarding is the fastest growing winter sport. The ski areas are welcoming it with open arms. As far as resorts opening, economics play a huge Part. Has the sport been accepted now? There's a lot of snowboarders now, and they bring incremental revenues to the ski resorts, and they need the business. And I remember the day that Squaw Valley allowed snowboarding, and I remember heading to the hills up there, and people just didn't know what to think of us. We were all in day glow, and they just didn't know what to do with us. 
it was crazy. I mean, it was really this thing of like, hey, a dirty kid might show up and want to ride with you as you ski. And he's probably going to have a sack lunch. And you're probably going to have a glass of wine, a little caviar, and a great cheese. It's like dancing in a way. It's the difference between doing the mambo or the watusi. It really doesn't make a difference if other people think it's a fad or not. As long as we have a, a hardcore group of snowboarders continuing on, I'm going to continue to snowboard forever, I think. In just 15 seconds from now, it'll be 1990. We are in agreement. Here we go. In five, four, three, two, one. Happy New Year! Craig Kelly's influence brought a huge number of people to snowboarding. He made it. Within a few years, the sport had become mainstream. As you can see, this sport is really taking off. Next decade, a lot more money in it. Contests are going to get big like surfing. It's going to become just quite more of a professional sport all around. It became a full mainstream sport. More than a quarter million people have put aside their skis and taken up snowboarding, we are told. I surf and skate, and it just makes it, you know, makes you be able to surf in the wintertime, you know? Paul is vice president of mountain operations at Stratton and credited with boosting the sport by being one of the first to open his trail to snowboarders. Good morning, Brian. Paul, good morning. How you doing? Good. Yourself? I'm fine, thank you. Ten years ago, snowboarding didn't even exist. Now, half the people on this mountain are on a board. Like George Blair, who's boarding at age 82. I'm a kid at heart, brother. Who do you allow to snowboard out there, Paul? We allow anyone. We allow them as long as they can get the board on. But we do encourage everyone, just take a lesson first and get used to it before you head out. It's become more than just a sport, it's become a lifestyle. Now it's gotten to the point where the equipment is developed enough that just about anybody can get into it. There's a lot more women getting into it. In the beginning, we had to push to try and get those pro models and push to get that women's snowboarding clothing line and have somebody believe that it's a part of snowboarding for real. Tina, how do you feel about being the overall winner today? Um, I felt really good pretty consistent the whole weekend. We were a part of snowboarding. My sister's been an icon, you could say, for a lot of women snowboarding. See how she does now. I think she inspired a lot of women to do it on their own level. Even people in my own company told me not to make a woman snowboard because it would never sell. It was looked at with the very skeptical eyes until it was put in the stores where it you know, went off the shelf like crazy. You can see snowboarding has left the fringe to become mainstream. It's just exploding. It's huge. And now, a freestyle moment with Sean Palmer. Smooth. Easy. Charming. Suave. Cool. Sean Palmer! Wake up, son. Palmer was the ultimate punk. The swagger, the snarl. He was like a cross between Elvis and Johnny Rotten. Stubborn, can be an asshole, can be a really good friend. He can be all of it. He's a beautiful person. I have a lot of Palmer stories, but I, I probably a lot of them shouldn't speak out of respect for Sean. When he showed up, he sucked the air out of a room. Lived as a kid in Tahoe with all the sports around me, all the winters and summers, so I learned to do everything. It was pretty cool. We did the skateboarding, the snowboarding, mountain biking, BMX, motocross, anything you wanted to do. You can put anything under his feet or put him on anything, and he's just an incredible athlete. He was living in South Lake with his grandmother, so he was pretty free. They kind of allowed him to skip school and go snowboarding all the time. Tom Sims had been giving Sean Palmer boards since the Tahoe Bye. dump days. The investment was now paying off. When he was younger, he was really into pissing people off, and by winning and beating everybody was, was his version of pissing everybody off. <laughs> I just was so fired up to fucking smash him, and I just annihilated him. There was a GS race, and Sean beat them, and he goes up to them right in their face and goes, I beat you, and I was stoned. <laughs> I drank a lot of Jack Daniels last night. I drank about seven beers today, and I'm drunk, and I'm going to win it. 
There you go. <laughs> it's all about drinking. Whatever it took to get him through the line, whether he's drunk or stoned, he still beat you. His father was an alcoholic, and I think that the genetics are predisposed for Sean. Sean's really actually a very sensitive person. In my opinion, he kind of puts out that facade to protect himself. Stay out of the fight and watch your language. I'm not going to tell you again. Okay, you just buy yourself a fine. Stay out of the fight. Don't go in the fight. If it ban me, I'll ban him. I yeah. should ban him. You should join a band. Don't go ban. You don't even know me. So mad, Dave. Palmer would ride a pipe with reckless abandon. He was the master of disaster. You want to go higher, bigger, farther, faster. He got a lot of that from Kidwell. Craig was more calculated, more practiced. I think the next overall world champion will probably be crowned around April of 1990. Snowboarding for me blew up at the Breckenridge World Championship. I don't know what I'm doing, I'll tell you the truth. I didn't take half-life 101. We know it's up, so we're supervising. Where's Carter? Oh, there. Uh, we wanted to get we're on the wrong wall. It was kind of that first competition where we had Europeans and the whole, like, this is the best that snowboarding had. I think this is the year where everything is blending together. It's incredible. I think the uh, Europeans are just ripping in the half-pipe and the Americans are ripping in the alpine events. We're dating their women, they're dating ours. We even get their women to shave their legs. They brought with them this entirely different perspective on snowboarding. A very carving, hard boot centric concept. In Europe, snowboarding had evolved along a different path. You have to understand something. In the 80s, no internet, no fax. For us, America was a very far away, big island. No contact. We had no contact. Alain Guémard uh, had the idea of doing a, a, a movie, and we did Apocalypse Snow, which was an extraordinary success. Apocalypse Snow, for European reasons, was amazing. Like Regis, when we saw the footage, we're like, that guy's nuts. Like those plastic boots on and like straps. <laughs> it was crazy. Now remember, in Europe, you didn't have any restrictions on ski resorts. Europeans, by nature, are much more open-minded than Americans, and it followed through with snowboarding as well. The U.S. was very much oriented freestyle. Europe, more all-around free ride. They're all right in Alpine. They can't do shit. Nah, five, a couple of them. I don't think they can do nothing they can do in freestyle. In the world. Sean Palmer desperately wanted to show the world he was the best by beating the undisputed king of snowboarding, Craig Kelly, at the 1990 World Championships. I remember Sean, he was sitting there in the back, he's like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna win it. Like, he had the motivation and determination to just, he wanted to win. You know, there was a rivalry between Palmer and Craig Kelly that shaped up. And really what it was was a proxy fight. Tom and Jake. We all took the early snowboard competitions very seriously. And you could feel all of that energy building. 90, it was a fight. It was a fight down in the finals. For most of the 80s, Craig Kelly had been the best half-pipe rider in the world. At the top of the pipe in Breckenridge, I had more pressure on myself than ever. It was like, it was your last shot at maintaining a world title. You could see, as each run, the energy going up, run after run after run of that last one. And it was just like, you know, you start tingling, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, Oh, 
bomber just came down and just poof, went really big. Palmer had good runs, but I thought I had better ones. Waiting for the results after the half pipe is always harsh. For some reason, the announcers keep you in suspense right to the last minute. So when they started announcing the names and they put Keith up there in third, I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm second or first. Wait, what is it? And in second. And they announced my name next. And I was like, oh no, no, I thought I had it. I think at certain times when Craig would get beaten, by Sean, it hurt all the way through the Burton company. He just went so much bigger than Craig. You know, more tricks was, yeah, OK, but going bigger with more tricks. Just like what happened with Jake and Tom Sims at the time, that competition pushed our sport forward. What's it take to be a winner? Big airs. A lot of people we like to thank today. A lot of smooth runs, can't crash. I sketched in my first run, I was in third going into the second run, so I had to go as high as I possibly could. I stuck everything I wanted to do, just like skating. For a while there, he couldn't figure it out. You know, That's about when the next year or so is when he started talking about retirement. He was done with competition. So you think I've seen everything now, right? Wrong. For a while, professional snowboarding seemed like a lot of fun to me. But now, at this stage in my career, I'm thinking more about really just enjoying the purity of snowboarding. Why I fell in love with the sport to start with. He just didn't want to get stuck competing for competing's sake. He wanted to go do what he wanted to do. But I just want to hook up with some of my buddies and take off, go hiking in the backcountry. Really, I think he probably just had that viewpoint that snowboarding is fun, and I got to keep it fun. Hanging out with him is fun, you know, like in Japan. We were riding through the trees in powder, and it was totally forbidden. And the ski patrol was chasing us all day with snowmobiles, and they could never catch us. <laughs> so that's like a day with Craig Kelly. Getting out there and riding a big slope is it's your chance to be free of all of society's little rules. and free of expectations that other people have of you. While Craig Kelly was riding the backcountry, more and more urban kids were heading to the resorts. These are the mean streets come to the mountains. The young and the reckless hurtling across picnic tabletops and each other. It's a lot of young kids getting aggressions out on the snow. We're kind of outcast. I mean, we don't look like skiers. I see it taking a different image lately. Kind of more skateboard influence. People are going to start doing some shit. These kids, they were all jumping off of everything. Anything that could be jumped off of, they went off. They got all over Donner Pass, over the railroad tracks. It's trying to be different from what uh, the guy before you was. Setting yourself apart. This is the greatest fucking rhyme of all time. Drill a hole in your head and pour it into your mind. Inject it into your brain. I'm talking main line. Cause I can look in on the top For me, jibbing like is just getting your board on anything but snow. All the guys from Northern California, skateboarders that got involved with snowboarding, had a lot of influence on where the sport went. I think when people took it to the street first, you know, everybody's like, that's not snowboarding. It is to them. That's how they access it. I think that's awesome. It's creative. There are two sports in snowboarding. There's snowboarding, which is a lot about turning and carving. And then there's snow skateboarding. And snow skateboarding is a totally different universe with a totally different group of people. It was kind of like a rebellious thing to do, like it wasn't, it was never really accepted, but it, a certain group of people like knew that it was cool and knew that it was fun and they like shared that thing together. Before I was sponsored, all the guys were wearing neon clothes and super tight stances and we were focusing on rails and all this stuff. It just seemed like the natural thing to widen up your stands and get baggier gear. And I think the bigger pants look better or whatever. I don't know. 
we started like, listening to hip hop a lot of that same time too. People wanted a piece of snowboarding from all cultures, from all ends of fashion, and they really grabbed onto it. And I think they could relate to it because it, it, it had this sense of freedom. It had this sense of here's a whole generation of kids that don't really care about anything doing this incredibly beautiful sport. Throughout the 90s, skaters had changed the face of snowboarding in the United States. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away in Norway, a young kid had learned to ride and was about to explode onto the scene. Up now, Terry A. Hawkinson out of Norway, one of the many Europeans here. A lot of Europeans racing. The half life is generally a U.S. sport, but Terry A. Hawkinson has really turned some heads at 16. He's the youngest guy on the pro tour. And that's when everyone was like, holy moly, who is this kid? Terry A. is incredible. I look for this guy in future years to be a world champion. And after that, he started to build this legendary status. He was cut from an absolute different mold. Terry Hawkinson, he's, he's everything. He's everything from the biggest douchebag you'll ever meet to, you know, greatest snowboarder of all time to just a, you know, cocky little shit. Where do you think the sport is going to go? It's going to go far. He was confident enough to take out those guys that had been on the scene for a while, and he was like the new guy who took over. I used to ski a lot, and I used to do racing in the weekend sometimes, and you know, really active on the skis. When I was 12, I saw Back to the Future and got my first skateboard. And I saw early that I didn't really have to go to school. Like some of the pro snowboarders were making decent money. I was about 13. I uh, bought my own board with my own money. My dad uh, couldn't really understand why I want to quit the state team in skiing and start riding on this, this plank. <laughs> Det så jeg ganske tidlig at uh, Terje hadde talent for at liksom, alt han var med på, det ble en uh, ofte god i og mange ganger best. Terje really changed the whole thing. I think he made it more fun and more exciting for spectators and everybody. My philosophy, if I can be as technical as Craig at the time and go as big as Brush and Palmer, I would do pretty good. Terry A. Hawkinson has won every single half-pipe contest he has entered this year, and chances are he's going to win another one. Terry A. Hawkinson became arguably the greatest snowboarder ever. This is the kind of riding that is, oh, blowing way out of the pipe. Terry A. Hawkinson doing what he's done all year. When you ride a perfect pipe or a transition and you land on the sweet spot, you know, it's, it just feels like a roller coaster. See if he can throw that trademark hawk and flip. Five feet out. That's the kind of stuff this crowd is looking for. Terry Hawkinson absolutely sending the crowd into delirium. Like in the men's competition, this event attracts the top women from around the world. Women's half-pipe competition has come a long way in just a few short years, and that has been made apparent by the way they have attacked this huge Stratton Mountain pipe. These are not timid women. Women's Progression is, has been huge. You are live and direct here with our spears in the place to be at Innsbruck. Yes, in Innsbruck, Austria, air and style competition. $50,000 of major prize money. I remember the big air in Innsbruck. One year, um, they said, oh, no, no girls allowed. And me and Shannon got our boots on. We're like, we're going to jump that thing. It looks crazy. Let's do it. So we had to sneak up, and we got up there, and we finally talked them into letting us go off the jump and at this point I really wasn't sure that I really wanted to because it was ginormous but he had told me I couldn't do it so now of course I was going to try and do it so here's me and Shannon we wore pink and we had pigtails and we're up at the top and of the jump and the announcer's like these crazy American women want to jump the snowboard jump I survived <laughs> I survived <laughs> To me, it was like, check, next. The money jumped in, money talked, and so we went to the Olympics. The 18th Olympic Winter Games, Nagano, 1998. Up till then, we were making our own path. So we couldn't imagine that we were going to wear uniforms or that there was such a thing as a snowboard coach. Ugh, really? I don't train. I skateboard in the summertime. I snowboard every single day in the wintertime. That's my training. 
The IOC had controversially announced that snowboarders could only qualify for the Olympics through the skiing organization, FIS. FIS is the Federation Internationale du Ski, which just the name tells you every reason why we hated it. They suck. The ski industry was one giant political machine. If FIS comes in my mind, I think about ties, dress, suit, and all that. The FIS and the ski guys are buddies with the IOC. So they go like, yeah, you can arrange the snowboarding event in the Olympics. Not the core snowboarders are really low what they're doing. And then they start blackmailing people into like, hey, if you want to do the Olympics, you got to ride our events. The greatest snowboarder of the time, Terry A. Hawkinson, was about to make a stand. Terry was saying snowboarding should be governed by snowboarders. And if it's not, then I'm out. He boycotted the 1998 Olympic Games. Giving the FIS a big middle finger. Yes, we were aware of dissident voices, but the general interest was that snowboard had to be in the Olympics to bring it to the next level. Why do you want to like go to a party when you, you kind of hate everything they do? <laughs> it's not my thing. Terry could have two Olympic titles in, in his belt for sure. Basically, he was leaving the podium open. What are your feelings about him not being there? I can totally understand why he's not going, because, you know, he doesn't want to jump through the hoops. I didn't watch the first year, actually. <laughs> I heard it was raining. <laughs> it's the newest and certainly the wildest Winter Olympic sport. For the first ever Olympic competition. I was the guy who was favored to win the gold medal. And I was just, yeah, no problem. I'm just going to roll up here and take this. I was pretty new in the contest scene back then. It was my second year as a pro when the Olympics happened, and the first year I was really bad. Standing in the starting gate, getting ready to take a run in any high profile event is one of the worst feelings on the planet. Cool. When I'm dancing around in the background, joking with everyone, and everyone's talking shit, like, I'm, then it's. Uh, up and two is Richards. Everything's still cool. As soon as I bend over to strap that binding on and get in that starting gate where I'm jumping the snow off, instantly I have to take the worst shit ever. So I was up there and I was like, okay, I cannot crash. And I was just like telling myself, okay, it's just a practice run. Forget all the cameras, forget all the people. Just do a practice run. It's a feeling of like everything is going to go wrong and everything is going to go right in the exact same time. And I sucked balls. I fell on my first run, so I was out. If you do something wrong there, you, you know the world's going to think you're a tool. I dropped in. Uh, I did a backside air, a huge tail grab, a cap 720 where I lost my beanie and my goggle, followed by an alley-oop stalefish and a backside 540. The backside 540 was just like on the last bit of the half pipe. I got kind of lucky that I landed that one. I was down there, I was really stoked that I landed my run, so I was holding my board and I looked at the big results wall. I was there, okay, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? And then uh, I see my name pops up on first place. Boom! Everyone's, oh, congratulations, I'm just the first Olympic champion in history. And I'm like, whatever, I just won my first contest ever. <laughs> I started my career with winning the Olympics. And that was pretty crazy. He could be in there. So Meanwhile, at the giant slalom event, a young Canadian was about to make history. The euphoria didn't last long. The athlete Rebaliati Ross, member of the Canadian delegation, is disqualified and excluded from the 18th Olympic Winter Games with immediate effect for presence 
of marijuana metabolite. When Ross got busted for smoking weed, I kind of laughed and I said, good job, Ross. He was being true to himself. He was not conforming to the corporate idea of what snowboarding should be. He claims the small amount found in his system is due to the significant amount of time that Ross spends in an environment where he is exposed to marijuana users. Today, an appeals panel decided that the IOC was wrong in taking the medal away from Ross Rabigliotti because it had not specifically clarified that marijuana was forbidden. As a result, Rabigliotti will be able to keep his gold medal. I won the medal. It was the best moment of my life. Um, I got the news that I tested positive. That was the worst moment of my life. Unfortunately, I'm not going to change my friends. I don't care what you think about that. I think my friends are real. I might have to wear a gas mask from now on, but whatever. This is one deadline that is non-negotiable. So help me God. 30 feet of just mayhem. Clearly a jet plane slamming into the second tower. Attack of proportions that we cannot begin to imagine. American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations. Terrier and Craig were drawn more and more to the peace of the backcountry. I think Craig was one of Terrier's favorite guys to go snowboarding with. I think Terry is pretty much the best snowboarder in the world. He may not focus on what I think is the best parts of snowboarding, but I know he could do anything better than anybody out there. Steiner. Hey, it's Steiner. Craig is definitely like at peace with himself, and you know, he was where he was supposed to be. Riding back on with Craig was like pleasure, you know, just to hang out with Craig, you know, kind of like an older brother. Obviously, Terry really looked up to Craig, but I think there was a mutual respect back and forth. If somebody enters into snowboarding or any other fun activity for the competition, they're probably missing the real essence of snowboarding or whatever it is they're getting into. Competition is such a small part and a small part of the feeling of snowboarding. I feel sorry for anybody that thinks of that as the the main source of fun from snowboarding. Craig Kelly wanted to understand the mountain better, and so trained as a backcountry guide and avalanche expert. He'd gotten this guide mentality where he really looked out for everybody. You just felt like you had an angel over your shoulder when you rode him. The biggest rush in my snowboard career was just my first time to Alaska. Just dropping into giant mountains that was so steep. We came halfway down the mountain, he was just this little ant in the middle of this big face. And uh, if he hit a little bump to do an air, he would just drift so far down because it's really steep. I think through the modern conveniences of helicopters and guides and you know, avalanche peeps, you have this false sense of security. But Mother Nature rules and she doesn't discriminate. An avalanche in snow is like a slow-moving wave of concrete. And then you have no control in that moment. Authorities in Western Canada are trying to figure out what sent off that massive avalanche on Monday that killed seven people, including a snowboarding legend. Nobody is supposed to die that young. Down from the mountain, nine Americans and one Canadian who survived the avalanche that left seven of their companions dead. And it was like swimming down the roughest river I've ever been in trying to keep my head above the water. He was such a good human being and, and so real and so down to earth. 
One of the avalanche victims was Craig Kelly, a snowboarding pioneer and one of the sport's biggest stars. Jake Burton is Kelly's a longtime sponsor and a more importantly, his good friend. Good morning, Mr. Burton. I just want to say we're, we're so sorry for the loss of your friend. Yeah, it's a tough loss for our sport. Yeah, and I know for you personally, and you know, everyone talks about what a big superstar uh, Craig Kelly was in the sport, a multiple U.S. and world champ, but he's so much more than that. He was just a, a wonderful guy by all accounts, wasn't he? Yeah, he was terrific, and what he did was our, for our sport was just incredible. I mean, his riding did just revolutionize, revolutionized freestyle riding in and of itself, but also he showed that you didn't have to compete to make a living in the sport and to show people what snowboarding was all about. He was doing it simply because he loved it, and that, and I, I do feel better, you know, in that regard. He was also with other people, and I think I'm sure it saddened him to see other people go with him. I'm sure that was very rough. Not just a legend, um, a good friend, a visionary, and just all around really, really good guy. We were now joined by Craig's mother, Janet Hansen, and his sister-in-law, Kelly. Good morning to both of you and our, our deepest sympathies to you and your family. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Mrs. Hansen, let me start with you. I mean, I read a lot about Craig this morning and he sounds like he was such an outstanding young man. He really was remarkable and he leaves behind a little girl, Olivia, his daughter, who is, is that right, two years old? She will be two on April 15th. And I know that he used to take her everywhere. Uh, when he went hiking or climbing in the mountains. She's been in helicopters, swimming. When he was home, they were inseparable, and he took her everywhere, and she was quite a little trooper for only two. We want to remember the other six families who also lost loved ones, and our hearts go out to them as well. Craig embodied the soul of snowboarding. When something like that happens, it just hits home so hard that I, I, uh, I fell apart. There was snowboarding before Craig Kelly and there was snowboarding after Craig Kelly and the Wanna Boys. At a certain point in the history of snowboarding, competition ruled the day and the thing that fed the competitions was snowboard camps and then you had a whole nation of kids that were coming to those camps and I remember they kind of came from two different camps it's that really wealthy kid whose parents can pave the road and then it's those parents sleeping in the parking lot in the RV who have one ball to place on one number before they spin the roulette wheel and their kid is that ball Let's meet our youngest competitor, Sean White, and find out how he got into snowboarding. Yeah, we went to Mammoth, and uh, they happened to have a little bitty board a little bit bigger than a skateboard. He was six years old, and we thought we'd give him a try on it. So he did so well that um, people would notice him right away. Sean proved to be a quick study, learning his tricks in a special way. My brother, like, taught me, like, how to, like, go and, like, pop the sides and stuff and get, like, big air. And he taught me like all my tricks. He is the greatest competitive snowboarder that's ever lived. And he certainly stands on the shoulders of all those who came before him. I'm Sean White, I'm 13 years old. I'm from San Diego. He was like, represented that first generation of guys who grew up on a snowboard. I've been snowboarding for about six years. He fights for it. I mean, don't think that it's just like given. <laughs> I don't come from like a rich family at all. Like we you know, managed to make ends meet with everything. And Burton was coming out with the, the kids line. And they're just like, here's a board. And if you keep doing good, we'll give you another one. I'm like, yes, got a snowboard. Sean is one that got into sport to be sponsored. So he's, he's chasing that. I remember we were in Japan and uh, he rode so well and he was still in his like little kid era. 
got like fifth or sixth, which was really incredible. And his parents was like, I can't believe he, he didn't get top three. He was this cute little kid his mom used to bring by and be like, oh, Sean has your poster on the wall. Sign the poster. Oh, uh, yeah. Till like the next point was like, oh, Sean, Sean's in the contest with you guys. Oh, it's so, so cute. Oh, Sean got second and you got fifth. What? I hope to stick with it and have a future. <laughs> When we were younger, we went surfing with him and his dad, and it was like, I had no idea, but we paddled out, boom, he's just like whoosh, whoosh, and then skateboard, these 900s, all kinds of stuff, whatever, you know? He's, he's the most talented dude there is. When I was younger, it was my outlet. It was like what kept me from doing all this bad stuff. I was out skating every day. I was making friends. It was like a social activity. Man, I thought you said no one was going to be here. That's that red-headed snowboard kid. Isn't there snow somewhere? <sighs> yeah, there's some freshies on the super jib in Tahoe, bro. <laughs> hey, Sean. Do you even know what that trick's called? Are you trying? <laughs> yeah, it's the... I don't know, but no one's ever done it, so watch me do it right now. Surfing, skating, snowboarding. It used to be that the snowboarders would look to the skaters for influence. Snowboarding is its own beast now, and it's, it's influencing everyone. As far as the cork moves, you've got mega ramp and skateboarding, where Danny Way and those guys, I know for a fact, are looking at snowboarding. Surfing. Everything's above the lip now. All the young kids are above the lip and they're corking, they're tossing their shoulders in. That's all from snowboarding. There will always be that cross-pollination and with the tricks especially. Sean went from being cute to beating people. Sean White, 15 years old, and uh, basically what he can't do, uh, he can't be done. All I think is Sean got a taste of winning and it became like an addictive drug. When you're on the podium, there's like 15,000 people around you on the stage and just screaming and you're like, wow. That's, that's an insane feeling. And this is not good for my heart. I think it's just pretty fun to have some competition and, and just, it's just snowboard, I love it. But I wish he truly enjoyed like riding town. Maybe he does, but I, I've never really seen him truly enjoy snowboarding, and I kind of feel bad for him because it's, it's rad, you know? I don't think that you can get that good without having a certain level of love. Does he have the same love that he had when he was 12 or 15? Probably not. He loves to compete. He thrives off of the feeling of that moment. I mean, I just kept winning and winning. I think he's really progressing the sport quite a bit. And I think he'll be the first guy to, you know, try to think what's after a 1080. How many flippy spins is that? Sean White is an icon. He has brought his image to the sport. That is probably difficult to beat. That was just really hard to get through all the pressure of the Olympics. I mean, I didn't really see it coming, but... It really hit me how huge the Olympics were before I dropped into the half pipe. The character that they're molding is someone who's acceptable to your average Joe in the state, who sells chewing gum. All the corporate companies just came in and swooped him up. You know, a young kid with huge red hair, and people can identify him, but they'll never forget him. We were told about this in the 80s. People would show up and they would say, hey, you know, one day snowboarding is going to be on television and there's going to be a lot of money involved. We had no idea what that meant. And sure enough, big money followed. And I'm thankful for the success and the, and the career and the whole lifestyle. But um, it's, it's not easy, I would say, to be in this position that I'm in. Mom! I think I saw something in the garage. What? Ew. Ew. What? A critter. Oh, 
I'll, I'll let it out. No, don't let it out. Chase it out. Chase it out. out. <laughs> I didn't know rat over here. Rat. Love you, mommy. Got you something. <laughs> you know. You deserve it, mom. You know how much you do for me? It's so extravagant. No, it's not. Not for you. This is all that you made while you've been no, snowboarding. No. It's more than it. No, was. it's not. Even though the world thought Sean White was unbeatable, there was a threat to his dominance right next to him. Keb and Sean have been friends since way back. They were competitive. That was who Kev wanted to be, was Sean. Kevin Pierce, he was the only person at that point who was kind of rattling Sean. In many ways, Kevin was a better rider than Sean. Kev had such the finesse in his tricks. Style is, of course, a key in snowboarding. Style has always been the cool thing, you know? Nobody has the same style, you know? That's pretty cool. I just don't want it to become a sport where it's like everybody's form is supposed to be the same. Kevin Pierce! There's definitely this built-up rivalry between Kevin and I because you know he was, I guess, the only one to really be beating me. He beat me at the, the European Open. Nice to beat him because he always wins. At any contest you go to, everyone's like, Sean's going to win, so... When you do beat him, it's kind of like, you know, tell everyone else to shut the fuck up. Sean was in first and just, uh, just snuck in there. Whew, I'm happy, man. Great day, great day. Let's Kevin Pierce! Leading up to the 2010 Olympics, Kevin Pierce was the only person who had a realistic chance of taking the gold medal from Sean White. That was insane. That was great. Really good. He did it when he had to, huh? Last run of the day. It's pretty cool. But Kev was kind of almost like for the love of it more kind of guy. For a long time, it never really was a job or had anything to do with making money or worrying about a contest. Or I just did it for the first maybe eight years of my life just because I loved it. It is a job, but at the same time, you know, it's the best job I could ever think of. Kevin Pierce, 21 years old, born and raised in Norwich, Vermont, recently resides in Carlsbad, California. I get a lot of motivation from, the, from all my friends, and especially Danny. We created friends so that we'd be able to shred together forever, you know? And things are just more fun with your friends. How did you guys all become friends? Uh, Match.com. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty much no matter who you are, if you're American and you're snowboarding, you're just a full rock star. When we go into a contest, it's like there's seven of us, eight of us parallel at the top of the pipe, and we all got each other, and that kind of, I think, gives us a lot of motivation. We were just pumping each other up so much. We've all pushed ourselves to such a high level. It's just because of how we get along and how much fun we have together. There was always a reason to be happy at these contests, and that was what it was. Take yourself out of the equation and really be happy for your friends. The Olympic year coming up, we're all kind of on it, and we're going to continue snowboarding. We'll work on all the new tricks we've learned and try and progress them over the summer and then hopefully in the next year. How would you describe this event from a rider's point of view? Uh, it's pretty intense. You're coming into the quarter pretty hot, and it's definitely a lot of danger. If anything happens, it's take a pretty hard fall, but it worked out tonight. It was fun. This is so hard to come up right now and learn these tricks. It's dangerous to learn these tricks without money. And Sean, he's got his own private pipes. I mean, that's how much more ideal do you get? It creates a gap. You can't just go in any park and do a triple cork. You need to have a big enough jump and a safe enough jump, you know. I don't see 22 foot half pipes everywhere. I see them at the events, the contests. I mean, if you're becoming a professional snowboarder, you should, <laughs> should start getting savvy with the, the half pipe being that size because that's where it's going.
part of the soul of snowboarding is progression. And it will always progress and change. And riding will get more fun, more interesting, more daring. When someone does something and they see that it's possible, then people all of a sudden, OK, well, that's possible. Is it possible to go just a little bit further? To be at that level, you're going to have to take some risk. 22 foot deep super pipe that's rock hard. You land on your head, something is going to happen to your head. Kevin was really seeming to thrive under those circumstances. American snowboarder Kevin Pierce remains in critical but stable condition tonight after a training accident yesterday in Park City, Utah. He was knocked out cold when he actually hit his forehead on the icy surface of the half pipe while practicing a new aerial stunt. He was flown to a Salt Lake City hospital, had surgery last night to relieve fluid buildup on his brain. I was kind of mad at snowboarding, you know? It just really hurt my best friend. You were kind of asking yourself, like, why do I snowboard obviously when you're a professional like kevin or danny or, or myself you have to constantly be pushing that boundary of what's you know, what's a makeable trick and what's just too far out there and um, you know kevin's was an unfortunate accident olympics like was so like whatever like whatever like my friend has just been seriously hurt if it was him and Sean at Olympics and he won, like, that would have been so sweet for him. But things happen, you know, and Sean's still winning shit. Ride pipe without you. I just want to tell you I love you, buddy. We're sending you all of our love and healing power. I love you, buddy. We love you. Love you, buddy. We love you, Kev. Love you. We love you tons. Fucking love you, KP. That support and all that family, that all for KP kind of thing was just support so that we could pull Kev out of his coma. Just weeks before the Winter Olympic Games in Vancouver, U.S. snowboarder Kevin Pierce sustained a traumatic brain injury during a half-pipe training accident. But now his recovery has taken a remarkable turn. Really, health is only important if the passion within is there. I think just finding out that he got hurt and wondering if that would kill the passion was probably the most humbling feeling. I really was feeling like I was at the very top of snowboarding and nothing could go wrong for me. And then just in that instance, all of a sudden, it was, my life is completely changed. You kind of don't really realize what you have when you're snowboarding until it's gone. Everybody wants to know, are you going to board again? And, and to what level? And a mom is smiling. And I would imagine mom gets a say in this. You know, are, are no, you going to no, no. get back on a snowboard? Oh, yeah. It's been a year and 11 months, so what do we say? 700 and something days since I've been up there. So I'm itching to get back. My hopes are to have fun. That's all I want to do is go have some fun. So much stuff has been going on constantly for two years. Just doctors, therapies, eye appointments, seizures, just like constant stuff. And just be able to be up here and enjoy the mountains, enjoy the, enjoy the clean air. I used to take this for granted. It's easy to get distracted from sort of your, your natural ways. But it's up in the mountains that I think where a lot of people find that in themselves. I think as long as people remember the roots of snowboarding, as long as people respect the backcountry and respect nature and snowboard for fun, I think the soul of snowboarding is safe. 
as long as we keep that focus on fun and don't get too carried away with taking ourselves too seriously, we'll be in good shape. What do you feel when you're standing on top of a mountain? You know, it's beautiful and you just feel joy, you know? I'm just a little part in the whole scheme and the bigger part is just nature. We used to always say snowboarding will change your life if you let it. And, and I still believe that. I snowboard because it's one of the best feelings in life. It's the freedom you have in the mountains that nothing else can give you. It's just like freedom. People are definitely going to always snowboard for how it feels, the passion. There was no goodbyes in snowboarding. I have friends, you know, that sometimes I'll, I won't see them for a couple of years, but I know they're out there and I'll see them when it, the temperature gets cold. For me, the story of snowboarding was just falling in love with a feeling and never letting go of it. When I come home at night after snowboarding, I'm still thinking about it. I don't know, I'm just a snowboarder, plain and simple. <laughs> when kids come up to me and tell me what snowboarding's done for them, kids who are in trouble, and then all of a sudden they start snowboarding and it changes their lives. It makes me feel so good. If I went back in time, I'd do it all the same, probably. So I don't really like to try to hold on to things that make me feel like shit. I try to just keep moving day to day. The backcountry stuff is just hard, but it's fun, because I don't, I don't really get the surprises anymore. Teaching my three sons how to snowboard, it, those were such huge moments in my life. When people tell me they just learned to snowboard, I'm like, yes. Another person captured by snowboarding. As long as I can breathe and eat and get a chance to board with a couple of my friends, I'm good with it. I hope to be turning powder when I'm 80. Will you join me? Yes! I have absolutely the best memories of the world of deep powder through the trees. And as I've gotten older and closer to the end of the whole span, I'm sure glad I have those memories. My son comes home from school one day, he goes, Dad, he goes, snow is 90% air. And I thought about it, and it's like, wow, that's like a cloud. You're literally flying. The best feeling is when you land softly or because then it feels like you're riding clouds. The first day kept shredded. Just the joy on his face made everybody kind of like, this is why we do it. This is what it's about, like, this is great. I think that the competitiveness is gone. And that's done and I've, I've come to terms with that. Tricks back again, and I'm, I'm all right with that. Snowboarding has pushed humanity forward by creating joy. Shred it up, finish shred. I really was making a toy to get the kids out of the house. And it was just a lot of fun. Just uh, check one out and at least try one. Okay. My name is Sherman Poppin. But in the industry, I am known as the grandfather of snowboarding. Uh, Jake Burton, 58 years old. Uh, I started Burton Snowboards back in 1977. It's about all I've been doing ever since. Uh, my name is Tarja Hågonsen, and uh, I have a lot of different titles. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a chef, and sometimes I snowboard. My name is Brad Stewart, and I'm the founder of Bonfire Snowboarding. 
and a bunch of other snowboarding companies. And I've been riding since 1978. My name's Chuck Barfoot. I've been building snowboards, uh, God, since the beginning of snowboards, 19, started in 1978. I'm Gigi Roof, and I'm a snowboarder. My name is Tom Shea, and I was fortunate enough to be the founder and publisher of the first snowboard magazine. I'm Terry Kidwell. I've been uh, snowboarding since 1977. My name is Norm Saylor. I uh, live on Donner Summit, been here approximately 60 years. Uh, my name is Todd Richards. Um, I've been in the snowboarding industry now for going on 25 years. Hey, I'm John Seaman. Uh, I'm a professional snowboarder. My name is JP Walker, and I'm a professional snowboarder. My name is Tom Burt, and what I do, let's see. <laughs> Um, boy, that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> so my name is Regis Roland, and um, I did start uh, snowboarding in France uh, 30 years ago. And my name is uh, Marcel Oz, I work for the International Ski Federation. Christophe Duby, Sports Director for the International Olympic Committee. My name is Danny Burrows, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Onboard Magazine. My name's Tina Basich, and I had a ride of my life snowboarding professionally for 20 years. Uh, my name's Mike Basich, and I'm a professional snowboarder. I'm Reto Lam. I'm a president of the TTR World Snowboard Tour. Michael Chantry. Uh, I've been involved with snowboarding since 1977. Uh, my name is Trent Bush. I've been in and around the snowboard world since the early 80s. My name is Danny Davis, and I, uh, I snowboard and have fun for a living. My name's Kier Dillon. Uh, I'm the CEO of a business called Friends. I'm Trevor Graves. We're here at my studio here in Portland, Oregon. My name is Dave Sioni, and I've made several snowboard films. I'm uh, Stala Sandbeck, and I'm a snowboarder. My name's Jason Lee, and I've been your narrator. <laughs>